Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash carnivorecast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. Hello everyone. And welcome to part two with Suzanne Alexander. We're returning to our discussion of her amazing expedition, research expedition to the Pacific islands to explore some native tribes there. Um, last time we covered Jayapura. Um, we went over the Donnie tribe and um, we're just about to start resume with. Yeah, we, we went and we, we went to Solomon Islands in Honiara, yeah. and now we're going to start with where we're arriving in Samoa, <laughs> our third stop, really our fourth. Yeah, Excellent. so this will here we are. If folks didn't listen to part one, go listen to part one now. Because <laughs> um, you'll get a lot of context and a lot of excellent discussion there. Um, but we're going into Samoa now with part two. And it's so good to be back with you again, Scott. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> you course. know, I got to ramble too much. It's just no, no, so you're fantastic. It was excellent. I just, oh, thank you. I just ran out of time. So, no worries. Thank you. All right, so here we go. So now we we were at Jepura and and Wamina, which is over in um, West Papua, Indonesia. And then we flew over to Honiara in Solomon Islands, and now we're arriving in Samoa. And um, this is quite an interesting uh, adventure that we took in this island. We spent quite a bit of time here because we knew prior to going that that they have some of the highest uh, obesity and diabetes rates in the world. And we were so hoping that we wouldn't see that, but we did. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go along. So here we are at every at each of the islands. We are, they have these magnificent, magnificent uh, markets, farmers markets, and they're just enormous. At least compared to what I have here in my region, I live in a small area, so we have small little farmers markets. But these were enormous. They have everything you can imagine, and everything grown here. Uh, they don't even use like the word organic in any of the islands because everything is just grown without any kind of fertilizer, no, um, you know, glyphosate, no pesticides of any kind. It's just as, as nature and God intended it to be. And it's just so beautiful. And just everything is just so fresh every day. And then they have fresh fish because you're usually right near the oceans many of the times, and you'll just see all this fish out. It, it's, it's magnificent, magnificent. And so here we are, um, we had our, our, um, our guide and our translator, his name was Poe, and uh, he knew this family out way on the outskirts. We wanted to go as much as possible to spend time with people who are living as ancestrally as possible. Mm. Uh, it was a little difficult in Samoa to find that because it, uh, our food has infiltrated our, our toxic food, our processed food and seed oils have really infiltrated everywhere. And it was shocking to see, very shocking. And so um, we, we went to this uh, gentleman's home. His name is Livingston, and he's about 82 years old. And here he is right here, over here with my cursor. I don't know if you can see it right here, Scott. And this is his home. And so over here, on this side over here, you can see this is the side of his home. And then this is their outdoor kitchen. And in every island we went to, they really don't have kitchens in their homes. They may have a sink and a counter type thing, which you'll see in, in some of the pictures, I believe. And that, but... They're, they're cooking outside all the time. They're either cooking like we saw in the Dani tribe in the earthen pits or open fires. And in this over here, oops, sorry. In this one over here, you can see right to the side over here, this building here, is, it's all open on all the sides, kind of like a pavilion type thing. And then they've okay. got an open air pit in there and you'll see what they're doing. Over here, you can see um, that Livingston, they, they do so much with coconuts. And he's got this little thing that he's stuck in the ground. He kind of made it himself. Everything's very ancestral that he has. And he's breaking up coconuts for us. And you'll see what he's going to do with that in a minute. 
So this is the pit, this is the fire that he cooks on every day out in his in his little outdoor kitchen. And um, you can see they've got tons of coconuts and they're always, and they use instead of oil again to cook with, like we were thinking they would use coconut oil. Yeah. They do not. None of the, and I was, this has really surprised me because in all of our research, you know, we're supposed to believe what we read. They say that they use coconut oils in the Pacific Islands. No, they don't. They use coconut cream and coconut milk, mostly just coconut milk. And they mm. get it themselves because there's coconut trees everywhere. And it's remarkable. So you're just going to see a lot of coconuts kind of hanging around <laughs> that aren't even used. And then they just toss them back out into their backyard, which is this massive acreage of, of just the most beautiful fruit trees and everything you can imagine. And they just, everything just decays and goes back into the soil. And that's their fertilizer. It's just magnificent. They've always got something cooking here. And right over here, if you can see where my cursor is kind of flying over here, this is, he went down, they don't live very far from the, from the ocean. And he went down and he caught some sea eels. And I was like, oh, eels. So that was me for dinner. So they, we were going to have eels that he had caught himself, 82 years old, and he goes down and snorkels and things. And then this is over here. And of course, everything is cooking in coconut milk. That's what they cook everything in. Hmm. And, and um, so this is um, cassava, cassava leaves yep. right here. And so they're cooking again in in coconut water and coconut milk over here on the fire they he, he, uh, the neighbors had caught those little tiny doves i don't know if you've ever seen little bird the little bird doves little doves yeah. and this is what they use for chicken they don't really have chicken oh. at, at, at least livingston said uh, through our translator that they don't have chickens in their region and so they just get whatever they can it's usually like a little bird they can find and so this would be their fowl type that they would be eating They're, the, a little a little dog little tiny little thing then they also have, we hear so much, we wrote about it in our book, um, breadfruit. And so this right here is breadfruit, these two big halves here, cooked in coconut milk. And this is, they use bananas. They're like these big, large green bananas. And they, they cook them like potatoes. I never thought of that. I was like, really? And so everywhere we went now, the island, it was bananas were Big, really big. And they had all different, they have four different varieties, but the larger kind they use like a potato and they they boil it quickly. Again, nothing's like overboiled, like we think for, to get the oxalates and all the, the toxins out of our potatoes and sweet potatoes. You boil it and boil it to get everything out. They don't. It's very quick and it's still, they're still kind of hard. You're still eating mm -hmm. them. They've got a lot of texture to them. Here they are sitting in, and everything's done by hand again. And here we have um. This is Livingston again, and this is his nephew, Norman, and they're making plates out of the leaves from their backyard. And so this is the plate, and then they're going to put a big banana leaf on top of it. And this was their, this would be their, the plates they would be serving often on in, in a traditional Samoan home. So beautiful. And here they are, well, what he was doing at the beginning when you saw him with that big thing and he was taking the coconut, he was getting the outer shell off of it. And then he gave us coconut water, fresh coconut water to each of us for each of us to have. It, it was delicious. He gave cool. us the young kind to try first and it was very fizzy kind of tasting, kind of like a, almost like a soda type thing. And I don't drink soda, but so I was like, oh, and this one was more sweet because it's older now. And this is where they normally, this is where over here you can see Norman, he's sitting at this little bench that Livingston had made and it's wooden and you take the um, the coconut that's been opened up and you scrape along it and then it fall, the scrapings fall down into this this pan and then they take the scrapings so you've been uh, and this is a this wait I'll go back this is a really short video but you're going to hear Poe our this is Poe right here you're going to hear him talking about what they do with this like grass type um skin from a tree and they're going to take the 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 coconut scrapings and they're going to squeeze out all the milk and you're going to hear how he's going to describe how they do it it's quite fascinating so you fill the, the skin off you can see the skin yeah it's still like this yes from what kind yeah. of tree oh. it's called by pa. By remember we yeah, saw that in the grocery store the yellow yellow one yeah. so yeah he just put it and make it up like this mix it all up once it's ready, so he's going to show you. Okay. So you know that that, that, that okay. old uh, coconut age, he's going to make the coconut cream with a special seal. Yeah. Uh, coconut cream. 
you must have a huge mechanical process to do this, yeah. like on a scale, right? Yeah. 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 But this is yeah. how we do it traditionally, ancestrally. Yeah. Look at this. Oh, isn't it amazing? Cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing such wisdom. So the left over from the coconut meal, you can use it to feed the pigs. Really? Okay. The meat? Yeah, it's a Okay, so that's that quick little video. Oh, and sorry. then, I'm going to get out of this one. Then, so I think I missed something here. Oh, I wanted, well, so then we, we have, this is the table now. And you can just see, this is their kitchen. All their kitchen inside is just a counter. There's really no cupboards. It's very, very bare inside. It's just, and this was the original home that, that Livingston grew up in as it's, as we've been kind of advancing, he's kind of tried to modernize it. And so all they have, all they have is just a counter with a sink. There's no cupboards, nothing. And then the entire living room is just this blank space with like a bench here and a bench there. There's, there's no TV. It's just, there's really not a lot. <laughs> Mostly they live outside. So it's just a shelter. That's basically what they use it for. And so this is the table. And at the table, you can see that they've got the dove, the bird, um, sitting inside that plate with the with the banana leaves that are kind of protecting it. And then on our, we've got the, a little, they put the coconut so it doesn't spill and tip over. They put them in some kind of a little holder. And this is an interesting, it looks like coffee, but what it is, is they've taken cocoa beans, fresh cocoa beans that they have. And they make, it's almost to me, because I, I I get migraines from chocolate, but I thought I'm going to try everything that they, they give us. It's yeah. like a tea made with chocolate. And it was very delicious, very, very delicious. I think they call it um, Samoa Coca or something like that. I don't know. I can't remember, but it was just very delicious. And okay. then you can see again, um, they've got their breadfruit and the bananas cooked in, in coconut milk. And there's the um, cassava leaves that have been boiled in the coconut milk. And over here is the sea eel. And so, and then the dove, that's what we were going to have. This is a typical Samoan meal. Mm. And then at the end, when you get done, they bring you over a pan of water with a towel and you wash your hands. Everything is just so, you know, <laughs> very old fashioned, very simple, very, very yeah. simple. And so that's, that was our time that we spent with Livingston in a Samoan home. But cool. you'll also notice though, that their health didn't look optimum. And so I asked Paul, who are with our guide and translator, I said, you know, I was thinking that if they're living transition, trans Traditionally, ancestrally, that they would be, a, you know, a more optimum in their health. And he said, you can see, he said, you know, fast food, um, processed food has totally infiltrated here. And mm. it really has. It really has. So, again, what we found, what we found here in, um, in Samoa is that the prevalent seed oil in Samoa was palm oil. However, we did see an awful lot of soil being, soybean oil is being used heavily throughout. There was a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the, the aisles of, of, that we saw of seed oils, there was an awful lot of soybean as well. Um, so every time I move my mouth, it, goes, it takes me somewhere else. Sorry. Um, so, and then we also found again throughout all of the um, of the islands, coconut oil really is not used. It's only used for skin and hair care. They do not cook with it. And so we were kind of that was that was one of the big aha moments. So, but often what we what we are led to believe in research and so forth is not really what it is. And that's why we like to go there and see with our own eyes and experience it. So again, coconut oil it's 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 very low in linoleic acid. But they're not using it. They only use it for hair and skin care. They're using coconut milk. It we saw was the the prevalent oil fat that they're using and cooking with liquid that they're cooking with. Now we move to one of my favorite islands was Vanuatu, and you can see down here, it's right there. So we came from Samoa, and we flew. We had to take a quick pick stop at Fiji, and then we went to Vanuatu. So it was a little a little bit to get there, but we got we got there. So here we are. And it was a beautiful plane. It's got the little, the little propellers going. I thought it was so beautiful. 
So here we are. We went to see this family. We spent the day with them. There's about 27 of them in this clan. And they were pristine. They were just absolutely beautiful. This is one of their warriors. His name is Yevi. And you'll see a video I've got of him. He's <laughs> it's like amazing what this man does with his mouth for the teeth care. Right here, you can see he's walking on hot stones. And of course, in order, we were kind of wondering, are they really hot? But the guy that was standing next to him, one of his relatives, he had took water and he poured it on and it was just steaming. So you could see wow. how hot it was and he was walking on it and it didn't bother him at all. Yeah. And I think, wow. You know, and of course, being barefoot is so prevalent in all of the islands. Wearing shoes mm -hmm. is just something that the, that the tribes do not wear. They do not wear. And I'm all about that grounding and just being as close to nature as possible. But that nothing bothers their feet. Wow. Oh, and of course, one just and the, and the families were so beautiful there, just so so beautiful, just beautiful, very healthy. Their skin was just not aging like what we saw the Danny tribe. I thought that they were very aged looking, and you know, even their thirties and forties, their skin was starting to look very old. But these people don't smoke like we were seeing in the Danny tribe. So again, is it the smoke? Is it because the Danny tribe mostly live on sweet potatoes and they're not getting enough protein and meat? This group here, they live about 50% of their diet is um, fish and chicken. And the other 50% is taro or cassava, which is very similar to sweet potato. And of course, a lot of fruit, which they have prevalent in everywhere you go there. But mm -hmm. again, because they had, and what, this is what, again, this is just what we saw. What it was, it's not done scientifically. It's what we visually saw um, that we just felt that of all of the tribes, all the people we spent time with, that the Vanuatu people, and that just this, that this, this tribe, but the population was extremely healthy compared to what we saw across the board in all the other um, places we, we visited. It was quite mm -hmm. remarkable. And here we are with some, <laughs> with some of them. It was just so, and again, this is Yevi right here. And he's one of their warriors. He's, he's, we asked him how old he was. And he said, they don't really know again, because they don't keep track of, of birth records. And so he says, he thinks he's between 50 to 60 years old. And he was just so prime and again, magnificent. So here he is, I'm going to play this video because I kept asking, I said, you know, your, your teeth, everyone's, their, their teeth look so beautiful. What do you do to maintain them? And he goes, I'll show you. <laughs> Listen to this. This is magnificent. That's how we crush our teeth in the village. That's the existence of a coconut. Isn't it remarkable? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Brushing his tooth with the oh, coconut. But look how biting into it is ripping into it. Yeah. And those are so hard and tough. Huh. Wow. Look at that. Wow. It's amazing. That's how we brush our teeth. Wow. It's remarkable. So we chewing kava, chewing sugar cane. It helps us a lot. Yeah. Do you what? eat do you eat the sugar cane? Yeah. Regularly? Yeah. How much? Uh, uh, how often or how much? Sometimes when you go gardening, then you get dusty. Yeah. You chew sugar cane. So <sighs> you you eat it. it. Yeah, you chew. Chew it. Chew, you suck the chews. Yeah. Then you just throw the waste. Do you do that You're regularly, like a couple of times a day, once a day? or uh, Maybe sometimes if you go to the garden today, tomorrow, after tomorrow, then I go. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just every couple of days. Or couple of days. Okay. Nice. Okay. Isn't it, isn't it something? Yeah. It's just, it's so, so we found that he was, and we asked him, I've got so many videos. So when, if you want to go to our YouTube channel, once I get that all finished up and I get everything all um, censored because there, in some of the tribes, there was some nudity kind of, so I have to kind of take care of all those issues before I get them all up there. But he, I asked him so many different questions. So I've got all these different um, videos of him talking about their diet and how they live. And again, he, he was just beautiful. I mean, I think he's, you know, he's my age you know, he's, he's about 60 and um, just beautiful. But I can't imagine biting into all the hard skin and things. That's just magnificent. So what we found, though, in Vanuatu is that the prevalent oil there, again, palm oil. But we were so pleased because most of their processed food was not heavily laden with soybean oil like we'd seen in all the other islands like their tin fish. And so many of the tribes and people in the communities were all talking about, even though they live near the ocean, many of them, they can't afford the fish. 
and they don't go fishing. So they buy tinned fish. They eat a lot of canned fish. And we were finding in all the other islands that their canned fish was packed in soybean oil. Hmm. But in Vanuatu, they had a wonderful selection and many of them were in water or spring water. And so that was my first, one of my first things. I thought, why are we seeing, because I eat sardines and, and I'm very cognizant of making sure it's always in spring water. Yeah. And people don't think about that when they're buying their tinned fish, if it's an oil or not, that's huge. Yeah. And so I, I, we were surmising, I said to Chris, I said, I think that's part of where they're getting so much of their cedos. They're eating a ton of these canned fish and they're not thinking about the fact what's packed in. So if you find, for those of you who are watching, followers who are watching, when you, if you're into the sardines and the salmon and canned fish, make sure it's in water or spring water, because they're, even if it says olive oil, you don't know if it's been, you know, adulterated with something else. It's just better keep it with the water. So that was very interesting. And we, again, coconut oil, again, rarely used here. And I asked Yevi and he said, oh, no, no, we don't use that. We don't use coconut oil, only coconut milk. And he said, but we use it on our skin and our hair if we're going to use the oil. And again, they make everything from scratch. So I thought that was really, really so profound. Then we were supposed to go to Tana, which was going to be another one of my big, huge, oh, it was going to be wonderful. But our flight was canceled and it had been canceled every single day that week. And the next day we were supposed to fly to Fiji. And so we didn't, we were not able to go there. And I was so bummed because there's a, a, a movie actually made by, a, on this, this group in, in the, 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 in Tana. And um, we were, there was a movie made on the about the tribe. And I was so, I had all planned that we were going to go spend the day with them, but we weren't able to go there. So that was kind of a sad thing. Then we flew to Fiji. A lot of people think of Fiji as just being, oh, it's a place where everyone goes for vacations. But believe it or not, there's some tribes that are there. And, um, and we had also been aware that their health may not be optimum, like we would think of someone who's living in the islands. So here we are, we're landing in Fiji. And there's an island and it's, it, uh, uh, the, it's a settlement and it was, it's been there for a couple, 2000 years or so. It was the first settlement in Fiji and it's called Visaisi. And this is what you see right as you're before you're entering the, the community, the village is this water. And you can see way out here, after you can see there's a person standing here and he's collecting mussels. So he's out there just collecting, you know, clams and, and oysters and things like that mm -hmm. right, right there, right there off of the, off of their village. But I wasn't really too thrilled with what we found. It was not impressive. So this is the village. You can see it's it's got, you know, they're kind of starting to build regular homes. Okay. And it's just, you know, it's very, it's lovely. It's very lovely. But I didn't want to share the pictures of the people that I interacted with because they were mostly obese or overweight. Um, and I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't think that that would be quite appropriate. So um, I was very sad to see that. Yeah. And I'll show you why. So everywhere, like we talked about, like, and I showed also when we were with the Dani tribe in Wamina, uh, in that region, they have what I was calling them the little shacks. And there are these little stores you can go to. And um, this one is very similar. When you walk in, you can't really go into the store. There's like um, a, a, like a wired um, area that you kind of go up to the woman who's standing there. And, um, and you tell her what you want and she'll get it for you. Same thing that we saw in the, in uh, Wamina with their little shacks, but you can't even go in. You just stand outside and there's a, a you know, the, the, the screen type thing that you can just talk through and she'll slide your things under, underneath it. But this woman was so kind. She let me go in and I did get to see what was actually in there. And it's got some wonderful things definitely that the people need. Cause if you don't have a car and you have to walk to these shacks that are like every couple of miles they're convenient because you know, for women with their, their monthly needs, they will supply those things. They, and they have diapers and things that people may not be using the old traditional cloth things that we would have used back in the day. But she also had a lot of oils that she was selling in there. And of course the tinned fish that had the soybean oil in it. So I wasn't happy with that as well. And when I talked to the people in the Vasaisi community in the settlement there, I said, you know, what do you, what do you cook with? What's the oil you cook with? And they, they were thinking what they were going to tell me was really great because they've been led to believe that oh, in the United States, everyone says soybean oil is so healthy. It's heart healthy. And so mm -hmm. they said, cook with soybean oil. I'm like, oh, you do? <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. But that's not good. They go, well, we also use mustard oil as well. Now, mustard oil is a, a, an LA of about 12%. It's, it's about similar, very similar to palm oil, which is 10. Yeah. 
But again, I would recommend that because it's still, it adds up. And we could see that in all the other communities, even though palm oil was the majority of what they're consuming, they were still overweight to obese in many of the cultures that we, in the, the, the islands that we were at. And so I've always said, oil, stay away from, go with, go with animal fats. If that's, that's the prime, you know, you're getting your A, D, K2, E, and there's so many wonderful things that come in the animal fats that we don't get in seed oils. And it's just, it's shocking to see how it's impacting these, these cultural, these, these native tribes and, and even the regular, you know, in rural areas. So then I asked um, my my guide and my tra translator to, to stop at the Hindu temple that's there because I've always wanted to talk with a monk and see what they eat. So this is the Hindu temple there in Nadi. And this right here, right here, this right here. And he's, look, he's in wonderful shape. You know, he's like 55, 60 years old. And he's his name is Priest Deepak. And this is his associate. I didn't get his name that day. And so I asked him, and he spent a lot of time with me. He was just very receptive to my questions. And I asked him, like, what would be a day that, that he would be eating in, in terms of his breakfast and so forth? And this is what he told me. I'm just kind of bringing it up because I wrote it all down when he was talking when I was talking with him. He says he eats about two meals a day, only two meals a day, and mostly fruits and vegetables. He says he gets up in the morning and he drinks a cup of warm water and then, or a cup of coffee or tea. And then he goes and he does his prayers and then he'll have a piece of an orange, a fresh orange from the tree that's there. For lunch, it will be white rice, which is and with dal, with cow yogurt. That's about the only animal meat, any animal, pro, that's what he won't, he won't say he's a vegan. He says he's vegetarian, but they do eat, they, they, they really prize the, the milk from a cow. He says about three o'clock, he'll have a, a cup of black tea. And then for dinner, he'll have roti, which is a flour pudding powdered curry with beans and okra and eggplant. And then before he goes to bed, it's a cup of warm water. And that's what he eats for a day. And I said, I would literally be starving. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. I was, I was amazed, you know, um, yeah. that's not a lot of food. Um, but I think, you know, I think the fact that he's getting the yogurt and the dairy there, I think that that's, that's a key to, to keeping, you know, his health where he is at. Yeah. Yeah. It's sustaining him. And so I thought that was, that was quite interesting to, to see that. This was the largest wall of seed oils I saw in any of the islands was in Fiji. I mm. was like, are you kidding? And almost the entire line up is soybean. Mm. Almost all of this is soybean. There was some canola, safflower, things like that, but most of it was exactly what the women told me. That I see in the community there, it is soybean heavily used there, and the population. It was definitely you could tell um, they were just not looking good at all. Very similar to what I saw in Samoa, in terms of obesity and overweight. So again, what we found most prevalent in seed oil there was soybean. It wasn't even palm at all. Palm oil was hardly even was hardly even there. So soybean and corn, canola, and then of course a little bit of the mustard. However, the mustard oil I would think would probably be probably twenty percent of their oil usage. But again, the the a mustard oil is again it's only about twelve to fifteen percent LA. But I would still stay away because it adds up, it accumulates in our bodies, and um, best to stick with animal fats, butter, tallow, suet, lard if it's ancestrally raised those kinds of things. Mm. Then we had some problems. Chris and I, everyone else says, oh, what a, you guys would lead a glamorous life, you know, just traveling around. And that's mm -hmm. just, that'd be great. No, it's not. <laughs> Whenever we're going somewhere, we don't know what we're going to be subjected to. Um, and with myself, I'm celiac. I have celiac disease and a lot of uh, food allergies and plants and so forth. And so I don't know what I'm going to come against. And Chris didn't know what he was going to come against. So the first thing that happened with us, Chris injured his knee while we were hiking to the salt spring. Right. He's now going to be having surgery on the 29th of December for torn meniscus. So he's going to have that taken care of. Um, my legs, this is what happened to me. I'm not sure if it's an allergy from when I went into the salt spring to help to uh, uh, collect the salt into the banana stems that we were, that we did, that we saw there, or if it's an allergy from a plant that I came in touch with or insects, but there were no insects in that region that we saw. 
but I had a horrible reaction. And here's Chris trying to solve, get it. Because if I touched it, I would start digging. He goes, no, no, no. So he was just so awesome. And I kept thinking, but what if it's scabies? You know, because <laughs> they kept saying scabies is so prevalent there. And I didn't know, but it, it went away finally. I only have a couple of scars left. Okay. And then I, because of my allergies and my celiac, I, we didn't know many times what we were eating and what I was going to ingest. And so I had ongoing diarrhea and my father would say, that's just not attractive to talk about. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm going to be honest. It was, um, you know, I'm very candor and very upfront about everything. Um, okay. So it was, it was difficult, but because I've had um, this kind of issue my whole life, I know how to handle it and how to deal with it. And um, I can kind of get through the day without having to too much of a problem. Um, but I did lose seven pounds. I left here at 112 pounds and I weighed 105 when I got home and I'm five, oh. eight. So that's, that's, I'm, I'm a lightweight. So I'm trying to get to one day to be 115. When I was vegan, I was 95 pounds oh. and that was, e that was eating 3000 calories a day. And I could not keep weight on as a vegan. Wow. So I've gained, I've gained some weight and, um, I'm getting up there. So it's a good thing. Then, um, then, uh, of course, um, Chris came down with a horrible lung infection. Um, it was probably because when we were on the planes, uh, we were in close contact. And at one, on one of the flights, there was a man sitting across the aisle from Chris and he was coughing the entire time. And I kept nudging Chris saying, I hope it's not COVID. <laughs> and he was like, oh, you know, and, but he ended up coming down with a horrible lung infection, which is, he's just finally getting over it. And then I lost partial hearing in my left ear from at one point when we were coming from Wamina to get to Honiera, we had five back-to-back -back flights in 36 hours. Oh. And um, and my hearing just, it was gone. So it's starting to come back. I'm starting to get some of it back. So um, all's good. <laughs> so those are, so it's not glamorous when we travel. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, I'm going to be going to Africa soon by myself on a solo expedition. And um, I don't know what's going to happen there. But again, I would say God's holding my right hand and um, but all is going to be good. It's all about learning and, and, and telling the truth and seeking what's to make us the healthiest we can possibly be. And yeah. again, we turned, returned home. I, I dropped, we dropped Chris off. We went, went from Fiji to LAX and, and, um, and California. And then Chris went to Denver and I flew back over to Syracuse region near where I really live. And then this is our book. <laughs> and this is a lot of what's in the book is about the islands that we visited. And we just wanted to see for ourselves um, what, 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 what we wrote was accurate. And it is, it's very accurate. So the book comes in four different uh, versions, the hardcover full, the full uh, color paperback and the black and white. I wouldn't even purchase it. I said to Chris, why are we even creating this? Because you won't even be able to see and understand the graphs because you need to see the color. But to me, if you really want to save money, I worked so hard to create this ebook and it's wonderful because it's one of the first ebooks that's ever been created with so many over 180 graphs and charts and pictures that are linkable. Usually you can't do that on an ebook, but we work forever and ever and it, it, it worked. So it is, it's cheap. It's a great way to go, but it's all full color and you can just link it's everything's linkable. You click on a, a picture or you click on something you're right reading about and it'll take you right to it. It's magnificent. Cool. And this is our motto, seed oil free is the key to being disease free. And I really believe that after especially being there to see what seed oils, before seed oils came into, into the Pacific Islands, they were so pristine. They were so healthy. Yeah. There was no obesity, no diabetes. They, they were just chronic disease didn't exist. And now they're, they're basically what we're, we're seeing what we're seeing now in Western, Westernized civilization, our, in our country, in Europe. And there's our book there. And again, it's right around Christmas time. It is a great gift for Christmas, the gift of health, the gift of longevity. So that's that. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, X, which was Twitter and YouTube. And again, all, all of our, all of our money, anything that we get is donated. Um, we don't get any, uh, we take no compensation for any books that we sell. It all goes directly to the foundation to help us cover the costs of doing lab work on take, going to the different islands, the different tribes throughout the world and doing tests on them to find out how they're doing compared to their cohorts who are no longer eating tra uh, the traditional diets anymore. Mm. And so our goal is, is to raise enough money to be able to travel to the different places. Cause right now when we went, we were not doing any blood work. We were not doing any lab work. It was all through visual. And okay. same with that. Go to Africa. It's the same thing there.
So that's that. And that's, um, I, I just, there's just so much, Scott, there's just so much that we came away with from that trip that yeah. it was life altering, just life altering. Any questions? <laughs> Amazing. Um, I think I asked a few on the last time. Um, I guess when, when you were there, did you like try to educate people or try to give them advice as well? Um, yes. And how were they and, to that? Yes. And it's, it's so funny because especially with our, our translators, because we had to translate to them and, and hoping that what they're saying is co- coming across the right way. Yeah. And they really were. I and mean, even the translate, everyone was just like wanting to know they kept thanking us. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and it, because they didn't know, but we thought that they were healthy. And I said, yes, everyone does because we've been lied, lied to basically we've been led right. to believe, you know, it's like the sheep, you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, being let off that cliff, you know, and it's just, it's, it, it's not, it's not healthy at all. And, um, and they were shocked because they really believed that it was something so wonderful for them, you know, and, and the, all thinking that soybean oil is healthy, you know, yeah. and in and, and canola, but at least we were so happy to see that it was palm if in the majority of, of the communities we visited, but again, it's still, it's, it's adding up. It is adding yeah. up. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. What what do you expect to find in Africa? Right now, <laughs> and that's all I do right now is I'm researching because before I go to any of the places I go, I have to become an expert on them because yeah. I don't want any surprises. And I really want to know where I'm going. So I'm really studying each of the areas and each of the tribes. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's almost, I, I'm seeing the same thing. I really am seeing, even with the Maasai, it's looking like there's, um, I might be able to find a couple that m- maybe have just a little bit like the Dani tribe, maybe, maybe 90%. Yeah. It's going to be traditional, but it is there. It really is. The Hadza, um, they're, they're still hunters and gatherers, um, but it is the tourists. It, the problem is that it's becoming such a tourist thing. Everyone wants to go and see the tribes. And so they're bringing them things. They think that they're helping them. So they're bringing them candy. They're bringing them, you know, bags of chips and all these things that are just doused with, with you know, the chemicals and the, the, the food colorings and the, and the, of course, the seed oils. And and that's changing their palate and what they're wanting. And um, I, I, I'm really, I, I think it's going to be a re- replay of what I just saw in the Pacific Islands. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully not. But it, regardless, it's important to document it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then it also gives me an idea because I'm trying to work with my guides there is to also take me to the, the the tribes that are really now being affected by processed food. So then we know that when we do go back and we have enough money to be able to afford the lab work to do on them, to run the adipose you know, testing to find out what how much linoleic acid is embedded in the adipose tissue and to do the blood work and so forth then we'll know, we know exactly what tribes we'll be able to work with and, and um, who would be willing to, to do this. It's, it's, it's asking a lot of people to say, you know, yeah. can we take some fat samples? You know, can we take some blood work? Um, and so it's, it's my job. I really want to go and really be familiar and, and live right in the, with the tribes and become one of them and um, understand what they're living, the harsh conditions. Um, you know, you look at the Hadza, oh, Scott, you know, the government has taken away all of the big animals. Like they no longer can hunt the big animals anymore. And so they're left with just these small animals. And often it's bats and rats that they're eating. Mm. You know, they're just so minimal and they're drinking like muddy, muddy water. Um, it's the harshest, harshest conditions. Um, so it will be interesting. And yet from what I'm seeing, they seem so peaceful. They seem so, it's, it was the same way with Adani. They live a harsh life, but they're so at peace and they're so, the love that they have in their community, the bond that they have, there's no, it's, there's no rush. You don't see anger. You don't see hostility between you. It's just, it's a different lifestyle. And it's so beautiful. You know, even though, you know, we, we all talk about here, everyone's just, so, you know, you see a lot of anger and everyone's just, Oh, you know, and, and then there's a depression and there's all these things going on. When we have the lapse a lot, most of us have this, it's so simple. We're, we're, we're in, you know, we have a light switch. We can turn lights on, turn on water, you know, flushing toilets, you know, we have food. They live in the harshest conditions and you just don't see 
those things. That's I, I think when my grandmother, when I was growing up, she always said she didn't want to leave when she was with her, with her tribes for three years. And I thought, how can you say that? What about your family? But now I understand because when I was there with, with the tribes in the Pacific Islands, it was so peaceful. It was yeah. just, wow, like going back 60, 70, 80, 100 years and just living off the land. And it was just very beautiful, very beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing, Suzanne. This has been extremely interesting and informational, and I'm sure the audience will enjoy it a lot as well. Um, and I'll, of course, have links to the book and both of your social media and the foundation as well. Um, and really appreciate you coming on. We'll have to do it again when you get back from Africa. Oh, I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, right. thank you. You're just a doll and wishing you the happiest of all the holidays and happy new year. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the show. You can find The Scott My Show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like, review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show.